For the Wild is brought to you in part by the Calliopeia Foundation. We are grateful for their continued support and the support of grassroots contributions from listeners like you. Learn more at calliopeia.org. To make a donation, visit forthewild.world slash donate or find us on Patreon. If you'd like to support us in other ways, consider sharing our episodes through social media or leaving us a review wherever you listen to the podcast. Hello and welcome to For the Wild podcast. I'm Ayana Young. Today I'm speaking with Enrique Salmon. The knowledge will reemerge when it needs to reemerge through this natural process. Enrique Salmon is Ramuri. He is head of the American Indian Studies program at Cal State University, East Bay. He holds a PhD in anthropology from Arizona State University and has published many articles on indigenous ethnobotany, agriculture, nutrition, and traditional ecological knowledge. He is the author of Eating the Landscape, American Indian Stories of Food, Identity, and Resilience, and Iwigara. Hello, Enrique. Welcome to For the Wild. So lovely to be speaking with you today. Oh, good morning. It's nice to be here with you. Yeah, it is. It is a good morning. It's sunny here at Cougar Mountain and the wood stove is crackling, keeping me toasty in this winter, <laughs> this dry but chilly winter. And um, yeah, I'm really looking forward to speaking with you about concentricity. And I'd love to give listeners some background on the idea of concentricity as it's an idea that courses through much of your work. And so how is concentricity articulated in our lives? It's, um, it's really about getting, helping people to see how we as, as humans are directly related to all the natural world around us, to the plants, the animals, even the stones, and so on, that they are our direct relatives. And if we can get more of us to start to recognize that reality, then it can have a huge impact on the practices and the choices we make with regards to our interactions with the natural world and our relationship building that we can do with this larger community. Mm -hmm. In concentric ecology, indigenous perceptions of the human nature relationship you write, quote, it's an awareness that life in any environment is viable only when humans view the life surrounding them as kin. The kin or relatives include all the natural elements of an ecosystem. Indigenous people are affected by and in turn affect the life around them. The interactions that result from this concentric ecology enhance and preserve the ecosystem. Without human recognition of their role in the complexities of life in a place, the life suffers and loses its sustainability. And I think about how many feel that the teachings of ecology remain mired in the paradigms of environmentalists and scientists who have historically disavowed the human as a way to sanitize and exalt their respective fields. And so I'm curious to hear what you'd say to those who are adamant that the earth, especially now, would be better off without humans having any role in it? Well, I, unfortunately, I think they would be sadly mistaken. To borrow terminology from ecology, I and other Native researchers and scholars like myself, um, we view humans as keystone species in environments all around the world, meaning that like Sawato in the Sonoran Desert, those tall communal cactus that grow up to 40 to 50 feet tall, if those cacti were removed from the Sonoran Desert, it would have a detrimental effect on the entire ecosystem. That's how important a role that those cactuses play in that desert. 
that makes them keystone species. Well, humans are this have been the same way in ecosystems around the world. And here in North America, when Europeans first showed up, they perceived this quote-unquote pristine landscape. But in reality, what they were looking at was this carefully managed garden that um, spread across an entire continent. And it was a garden managed by Native peoples. There wasn't hardly, there was hardly any place in North American continent, in this case, that was not untouched by human hands. You know, only the highest mountain peaks and maybe, you know, a few areas of, say, Death Valley, um, where there's not really much going on with regards to Native peoples interacting with and sustainably managing these landscapes. And we can demonstrate this, uh, I guess, again, to borrow from, you know, this, the ecological terminology on an empirical scale and, and using um, empirical evidence when, for example, in the desert, the Mojave Desert in, in Southern California, I was part of a meeting years and years ago with Park Service folks and some Paiute and Chimuewe people there. And the Park Service people were trying to explain to the Native folks why it was important to leave some of the landscape, the desert landscape, untouched so, so that it can it can regenerate itself. And I'll never forget this elder woman who got angry with the Park Service people and telling them, you're just letting the desert go to trash. You're destroying the desert, she said. You're making it a waste. And she went on to explain how by allowing native peoples, in this case of the Mojave Desert, to come and to collect the pods from mesquite trees, that it had a positive effect on the biodiversity of the landscape because the pruning of the trees through the collection of the pods was good for the people because it was an important part of their food source. But it also, by collecting the, the pods, it actually caused the mesquite trees to grow more pods. And part of the process of collecting was to have controlled burns, to do some pruning and coppicing below the mesquite groves. And that created more space for small mammals to move in the mesquite groves. And it decreased competition for the mesquite trees and other useful herbaceous plants. And so in other words, when native peoples in this situation were using the desert in a sustainable way, it actually creates more diversity, and not just for the people, but it's a positive thing for the animals, the insects, and the plants. Mm -hmm. Thank you for sharing that story. I was imagining the mesquite pods and, yeah, just that sacred relationship that we've been conditioned out of, some of us beaten out of. And, yeah, it's, it feels so important to speak about this reconnection. And I understand that this notion of concentric ecology was something that you created in order to address the lack of indigenous perspective in Western paradigm. And I do think it's interesting how captivated and attached Westerners have become to certain concepts like ecology and cosmology, but it feels as if many get stuck in the abstract cultural realm. So what are the challenges of cross-cultural approaches to knowledge? Um, I think the biggest challenge is our languages and the meanings that we connect to certain words. You know, for example, I have difficulty with um, this notion, this concept of traditional ecological knowledge. It's been around for, for a few decades, but because of this, the words traditional and ecological it reframes native knowledge automatically when we use this phrase into a Western model of describing 
and trying to interpret how indigenous peoples view our relationship to our landscapes. Ecology is, as you know, your listeners will know, is just you know, disciplinary study um, interactions in particular habitats and ecosystems and so on. But it's a Western frame. It's a Western frame that detaches the observer from what is being observed. And so it becomes this objectified approach to the natural world as if it's a thing. And for native peoples, those of us who are, you know, we still are still see ourselves as practicing our ancestral connections and relationships to the natural world, it is not just a thing, it's a being. It's a relative. It's a part of us. We are a part of it. Um, I remember standing on the Hopi mesas one day during a, a, a basket dance, and one of the my friends there was look, was with me. We were watching these rain, these these um, pods of rain coming across the Colorado Plateau, coming from the south where Flagstaff is and the San Francisco peaks over there. And you can see these pods of rains just moving across the desert. And I remember him saying, you know, we're looking at ourselves. That rain is us. We are that rain. And this is an exact way of how Native peoples around the world perceive our relationship to these landscapes around us. It's not something that can be objectified. And so... When I come back to some of this language, traditional ecological knowledge, it becomes this, this static, objectified way of trying to describe this, this very complex and sophisticated relationship that indigenous people have. I do a lot of work with American Indian foodways and agriculture, and there's been this newer idea of what's known as regenerative agriculture. But again, it's this Western frame of trying to explain how indigenous people grow food. And again, objectifies the practice, when in reality for native peoples, it is something that that we do that, re, that reemerges from you know, um, a millennia of connecting ourselves to the landscape through our food. It is a identity and that, that traces its, its um, origins to our clan histories. And I can just keep going on that it's not something that can just be described in one way. It's, it's several things. It's this overlapping complex of identity and worldview and spiritual connections and these like the word I keep coming back to this relationship that implies a responsibility that we have to the natural world because it is so directly related to us. Yeah, this isn't the first time that I've heard critique on terms like traditional ecological knowledge and regenerative agriculture, I feel like this challenge against these words that have you know, now been co-opted and used by a lot of non-Indigenous people to get funding or attract attention. And yeah, it's very problematic. And TEK, or traditional ecological knowledge, have become very popular in the lexicon of environmentalism. And it often feels as if everyone needs to publicly translate their understanding of these concepts for show. But yeah, I know you've urged caution at the practice of transforming knowledge and taking it out of context for the sake of preservation. So why is it that you think dominant society has become so obsessed with memory banking and what advice would you offer on moving into a concentric practice of practicing living knowledge? I think there is this, this effort to create these memory banks, partly because we're, as a larger society, are observing, we're observing the disappearance of 
libraries of knowledge as a result of language disappearing around the world among native peoples and then the elders disappearing who are the ones who have been holding on to the last vestiges of these this these libraries this um, pandemic has sped up this process unfortunately um, i was very saddened recently watching an interview with a younger navajo woman on the reservation explaining how the pandemic has disproportionately hit the elderly. And she was describing how everyone, every time one of these elders dies, all that knowledge goes with them. And this is just increasing exponentially around the world. And so I can understand people wanting to develop these memory banks to try to hang on to some of this, this knowledge, unfortunately. Again, from an indigenous perspective, it, in a lot of ways, kills the knowledge when we create memory banks. This kind of knowledge that we're talking about is alive. It is an entity of its own. It has a spirit. It has a breath that we share with it, like we share the same breath with all the natural world around us. And it is not something that can be stored and pickled like in a like when we pickle chili peppers or cucumbers and that sort of thing. I mean we put it on a shelf to look at and use later on. This is a kind of knowledge that nads needs to be kept alive through language and through practice, through actually living it. I'll never forget when I used to teach an ethnobotany field school and my students and I were visiting a Hopi elder in between um, third and second Mesa near a community called Kakotsmovi. And my students were hoeing his field of weeds and, and then he would, you know, stop every now and then and explain uh, some, you know, important ecological Hopi knowledge to my students. And there was a great exchange I remember at one point, one of the students asked the elder, why don't you just record what you know? Because he was the last member of his clan. And he was explaining how when he passes away, all his knowledge will go with him because he doesn't have any female children. The Hopi, like a lot of Native communities, are matrilineal societies. And so knowledge passes down through the female side, the matrilineal side. And so the students were concerned, and he said, well, you know, when I leave, this knowledge leaves with me because that is just the way it has to be. It'll, it's a part of the natural process. The knowledge will reemerge when it needs to reemerge through this natural process. Memory banking, as I, I said earlier, I understand why people want to do it, but it just creates this static, again, objectified kind of knowledge that is, as soon as it's recorded, it's um, taken out of context already. I'd like to now ask about what a concentric approach to something like invasive and native species looks like. 
data suggests that, quote, at least 25% and perhaps as much as 85% of Earth's estimated 8.7 million species are already shifting ranges in response to climate change, end quote. And these sort of migrations are complex because on the one hand, invasive species have been flagged as a key driver of Earth's biodiversity crisis. But I also hear perhaps a more concentric approach would view this change as a natural migration. Kin are doing what they have to do. So I'd like to ask your thoughts on this and how you think concentricity needs to be applied to traditional ideas about native and invasive species and how we define desirable environments. Um, You kind of answered the question already. Remember that I like to use this example here again in North America, where American Indians have been, if, if, we, if we take the most conservative estimates of the pop, of populations here in North America of indigenous peoples and how long we've been here, some, some anthropologists suggest 20,000 years. I think it's a lot longer. I think we've been here for at least 40,000, maybe even 100,000 years, if, even if we assume that we weren't always here, as our, our legends and our cultural histories describe. But even if we take the most conservative estimate of 20,000 years, that means that Native peoples have been observing and interacting this continent and its, inner, its, its um, natural workings for 20,000 years. European biologists and so on have only been looking seriously at North America for maybe 200 years. That's quite a difference in the degree of understanding of the natural world in North America and South America that Native peoples have compared to that of European science. And so therefore, our stories, our cultural histories, our, our songs, our ceremony, our rituals, these are all reflections of this deep understanding of these, these complex workings that happen in ecosystems. And part of that understanding is change, that things are in constant flux And our ceremonies recognize it. Our songs, our stories recognize these complex changes. This is the reason why we have most Native peoples around the world tell trickster stories. It's this recognition of that gray part of the universe, that part of the universe that we don't quite understand, but we know is there. And that's trickster. And here in North America, trickster is often personified as a coyote, sometimes a rabbit or a skunk. But these these trickster tales and legends and myths, whatever we want to call them, are reflections of that recognition of constant flux and dynamic change in the universe. And so it's a long-winded way of answering your question that for native peoples when we have new plants invasive species show up we don't think of them as in a negative way we think of them as as part of the natural process and then we come up with ways to incorporate them and adapt to them in our practices and in our our stories Um, we even connect them to our languages There is a classification of plants in my people's language. I'm Ramuri, um, in case um, your listeners didn't get that yet. Uh, Some people call us Arohumara. And in our language, we have words for certain plants that arrived more recently um, that came with the European contact. And so it's just this linguistic, and then as a result, this... Um, metaphorical and worldview approach towards accepting and adapting to these new things that have entered into into our lives. Wow, that was so beautiful and relieving. 
I've been really sitting with these Western, thinking back to language and thinking about words like apocalypse and collapse and Anthropocene and how I've heard a lot of my indigenous friends and allies say like, you know, we've been through apocalypse, we've been through collapse before. This is because, you know, so many people are talking about that with climate collapse and just where the world's going at this point and the sixth mass extinction and the way you're bringing up trickster and speaking to these huge shifts in the way that you are is, yeah, it just feels really potent. And in your recent book, Iwigara, you write, quote, through trickster, we learn to embrace non-polarity. Color blindness is assumed as well as every variation of gender. Therefore, trickster expands the indigenous consciousness by freeing all constraints and creating an opening and threshold for flexibility and change. Through this kind of consciousness, culture and society are in a better frame for resilient thinking and adaptation, end quote. Oh, yeah, I just, I really think about trickster energy in terms of ushering us through moments of collapse and apocalypse because it feels as if many are becoming snarled in the polarity of our projected futures. So I just, I would love if you could elaborate a bit more on trickster in terms of resilient thinking and adaptation. <laughs> yeah, um, I often sign my emails to my colleagues in my department and El Coyote, <laughs> the, the trickster. You know, trickster, or if we were to focus on Coyote as a trickster figure, Coyote would never get his coffee from a Starbucks. <laughs> Coyote would never shop at a Walmart. <laughs> Coyote probably wouldn't even have cable TV or direct TV. Um, Coyote does not want to be stuck in this one polarized perception of of itself and I, I intentionally use the word it because coyote does not have a specific gender um, coyote is just coyote or trickster is just trickster and it's this you lead me to another approach i've taken to my work you know all my work as an indigenous scholar has been about trying to help non-native peoples better understand an indigenous approach to, to everything, you know, not just the natural world. And a few years ago, I came, I, I adopted this, this um, approach to studying natural systems through what's known as resilience theory. And in, this, in short, it's this idea that systems, any kind of system, uh, that is resilient is resilient only because it's it was able to withstand and adapt to and learn from and reshape itself as a result of shocks to its systems. And in the case of native peoples, the shock would be European contact. And a lot of native communities resisted and unfortunately, to their own detriment, resisted and you know, went extinct. And some communities like mine, we figured out quickly how to absorb to and adapt and learn from these new things that came as a result of contact. And it's those indigenous communities that are still resilient, that it really that adopted the trickster approach to everything, to recognizing that change is constant and that our, we have to allow our inner tricksters to emerge, to come to the surface so that we can survive and we can learn from and adapt to these, these changes and these new ways of doing things. We therefore you know, increased the emergence of, of tricksters in our ceremonies to remind people about constant change. You know, we see more um, koshare, the, the clown figures at Pueblo um, dances. You see more of the, the gray one in the gone spirit, mountain spirit dances with the Western Apache. 
Um, in my people, we're seeing more of the trickster busco dancers. This is um, in our, our spring ceremonies, our planting ceremonies. And so it's just as we're, we're telling the rest of our society, we have to continue to recognize this increasing and speeding up of change so that we can survive. We are, as Native peoples, we're like juniper trees in the Southwest. Juniper trees aren't that tall. They're sometimes kind of scraggly looking on the surface, but the roots grow very deep and spread out. And I'll never forget an elder at Taos Pueblo telling me this story about how um, European people, you know, Americans for the most part, are like aspen trees. They're tall and beautiful and showy in the, in the, you know, in the fall, but their roots are really shallow. And next big wind that comes along, those, a lot of those aspen trees will fall over. But us native peoples, we're the junipers. When the big wind comes, we're still going to be here afterwards. Wow, I was getting lost in the metaphors of the trees. I was right there with those trees. And yeah, I'd like to ask about exploring concentricity in places that the Western paradigm has unequivocally denied as being a part of nature or the wild. So how can we work to disrupt the nature city binary and for listeners, how can one begin to incorporate concentric approaches amongst the wealth of natural ecosystems in urban areas? You remind me of another a chapter I wrote in another book. And it was, the book was about wildness. And my chapter was about how in my language and in most indigenous languages, there's no word for wild. And this is because Euro-Americans, the language, again, coming back to language and how important it is, perpetuates this idea of the separation between us as humans and everything else. And so we have this category of wild and wilderness, places that we're not supposed to, to visit, or if we do, we leave only you know, footprints. This notion of wilderness, something that is totally separate um, from us as as modern day human beings, that we are that things that are wild are are untamed, that they're they're out of control and so on. And so there's this sort of negative connotation with these notions of wild and wilderness. And I think it expands into notions of the of nature and increases this urban versus mod urban sort of schism and when in you know for indigenous peoples if there's no word for wild no word for wilderness then there's no category there's no no mental space for seeing a such a division even for indigenous peoples living in an urban environment we still recognize that everything around us is a part of the natural process, even the urban stuff. It's we're still directly related to it. It is still a part of us. We are a part of it. And even if we want to hang on a little bit to this this urban versus non-urban division, we can still find and celebrate the the natural that is around us in this urban environment. We can still celebrate the natural process of climate. We can still um, see insects and birds and you know, listen to birds and pay attention to the stories that they're giving to us. Uh, we can still, um, even as my mother, she got older and living in this little apartment sort of complex is assisted living place she still found ways to grow her favorite little herbs and chili peppers and so on outside of her front door and celebrated those little tiny connections to to nature 
I never forgot the importance of singing songs to these things. And would go out even at night and sing songs to the stars because even in an urban situation, we can still see the stars up there, our relatives in the sky, and we can still sing songs to them. And it's just a, it's a mental game, I think. I invite urban dwellers to play, to not focus so much on the separation between the urban environment and the so-called natural world, but to celebrate what is still there with us and to invite more of it to join us in places like the Bay Area, like Chicago, Los Angeles, Seattle, and to find ways to work to bring in more of, of the so-called natural world into these spaces. And we're seeing this happening more and more with, I guess it would be sustainable architecture. People wanted to create rooftop gardens to create more green spaces in urban areas. You know, we can, we can work to do more of that. Yeah, I feel so connected to what you're saying in terms of the frame of mind of being connected or disconnected or a part of nature or separate from nature. And yeah, to play, to get into our mental games because my gosh, our minds are so complex. <laughs> but also I think our our needs and our desires are actually quite simple, but somehow this complex web in our heads make things so hard. And yeah, I, I really appreciate that invitation. And can I can I speak to that, please? Because I want to add to that the the importance of story. You know, we as human beings we wake up to our stories every day, and we live our stories every day. Sometimes there's several stories we're living every day. You know, in 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 this European Western society, you know, we think of stories as like, you know. You know, the Beauty and the Beast, Hansel and Gretel, that sort of thing. You know, they all, you know, once upon a time, and then they all lived happily ever after sort of thing. But if we stretch this notion of story, story is all that we are. We are stories. And we we enjoy telling stories. We enjoy um, hearing stories because it's a way for for humans to find commonality. Uh, you've probably noticed already in this this, this interview, I, I like accentuated things that I'm saying with stories <laughs> because it's a way to help the listeners in this case to find their own space within this to these topics that we're talking about and to connect to it in some way, to relate to it, and develop a relationship with, with it. That's the power of story. And so I think we need, as a society here in the West especially, need to find a way to change our story. What if the American story was not the one connected to manifest destiny of you know this ongoing desire to conquer and control the entire continent? this need to be the rugged individual frontiersman and frontierswoman and that sort of thing, um, to be the individual. What if our story was more of, say, you know, to borrow from American history, what if our story was not Paul Bunyan, but the Lewis and Clark expedition? What if we borrow from how the core of discovery left you know, what we call the shores of Missouri along the Mississippi River and traveled up to the Missouri River, interacted with countless native communities, made it all the way to the Pacific Ocean, made salt, ate a bunch of salmon and elk, and then came back. And the whole time, they only lost one member of their party. That was only because of appendicitis. They accidentally 
killed a couple of Blackfoot Indians because of a misunderstanding over some horses. But it wasn't because of hatred or so on or, dis, or racism. It was, just, it was more of an accident. So the whole time, there was a story of collaboration. And what if we made that our story of finding ways to interact peacefully and to collaborate as opposed to the larger, unfortunately, American story today of individualism and conquering. And then we would we could slowly create a different society. Umbundo. Kimbundo. Kikongo. Chokwe. Kwanyama. Oshi Kwanyama. Gangela. Lingala. Bangala. Lunda. Ngoya. Nyaneka. Oshiwamu. Songo. Zinga. Zinga. Queen Zinga. I want to bring up restoring indigenous history and culture to nature, which is a part of the original instructions anthology. You write, quote, the landscape becomes a moral landscape. As we move across the landscape, it's not like we go across thinking of these stories all the time. We are remembering this story and that story and so on, but it's just a sort of automatic subconscious connection to all these things in our environment to the plants, to the animals, to geographic or geologic formations, and so on. As a result, our morality is directive, or becomes directly from a landscape. Consequently, we find a way to interact in a kind way with our landscape, end quote. And so I'd like to hear more about how the moral landscape functions and whether or not this will take on new meaning as we find ourselves in an age of migration and changing ecologies? The the land is a living entity, and it is constantly in conversation with those of us who know how to listen to it. And through those conversations, there's there are lessons. And this is a, an example of how our histories, our stories, are encoded and embedded in the land itself. The land, our our stories that always take place on the land and include things that come from the land, natural entities, animals and plants and insects and so on. They all emerge from the landscapes and we find ourselves as indigenous peoples emerging into this kind of of mental space and therefore our languages are actually voices of the land and so when we speak our native languages we're actually speaking the voice of of our specific landscapes across the continent and around the world um and so our morals are not human made. We didn't develop the ways or values of ideas of right and right and wrong and so on from human constructs. We developed them from our experiences on our specific landscapes. And so that's what I mean by the emergence of you know, the our moral or the idea of, of moral landscapes. You know, the, the land itself or this is a source of our values, of our morals. And it, these values and morals are encoded in the stories about our connections to the land. <laughs> 
um, and in our our modern day society where we are in constant movement and where a lot of us are so disconnected from anything from the natural world, it's increasingly difficult to recognize those morals. It's increasingly difficult to even hear what the land is telling us. Uh, I want to go back to my example of the student exercise where I had them watch sunset and sunrise. And there were more than just a couple of students who never realized that as seasons change, the path of the sun changes, that it would set or rise um, in different parts of the horizon. They had been so disconnected from the movement of the sun that it took that awareness kind of practice to see that, oh, that's right, the days do get shorter as the year gets closer to you know October, November, December, and so on. And so that's how disconnected our modern society is. And it's even increasingly disconnected as we are having to do things more online. You know, we're sitting in front of our computers and hardly spend any much time outside. And it, it's it's uh, for people like me, it's creating this increasingly sense of, of dread that our generations as we move you know more and more into this 21st century are less understanding the need for us to be connected to even simple things like the sun and the moon to understand the importance of just being able to hear bird song and so yeah this is one of the responses that i don't have much of a positive reaction to because it's uh, it's it's just kind of getting worse, especially in this pandemic, is making things worse, as we are increasingly forced to have less contact, not just with the natural world, but with each other as human beings. It's such an important source of wellness to just be able to do something as see a person smile that we're standing a few feet away from. Um, we need that connection, and it's it's um, it's gone from us right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a really challenging time for connection, and I hear you in that grief. Mm. Well, going back to your book, Ivigara, you cover the plants that are most important to Native North American peoples. And I wonder if you could speak about how you define importance when you look at something like that. Well, you know, when I was invited to write the book by Timber Press, you know, they, they originally wanted me to write a, a larger sort of, of um, I guess like a, a, a dictionary sort of thing of, of indigenous ethnobotany. And I... You know, I, I sat with that for a little while and then I realized, you know, I really can't, I don't really want to do that because there's been, there's been a lot of books um, about American Indian plant knowledge and they're really just these sort of dictionaries like here's the name of the plant, here's what its name is and then Shoshone or Lakota and then here's what it's used for. And I wanted to do something deeper. I wanted to be able to tell the stories of the plants so that the readers can understand the plants more in just a sort of static dictionary kind of approach to ethnobotany. And so I proposed to Timber Press, why don't I do a, uh, fewer plants, but larger, longer descriptions of them? And they liked the idea. And then I, what I did is I contacted my network of, of plant knowledge holders across the continent because I've been doing this for several decades. And so I asked them, can you give me a list of, in your mind, the top 10 most important plants to your people and to where you live? And so I got those lists back 
then from that list, I, I came up with the 80 plants that are in the book. These are the plants that are most important in the minds of indigenous peoples across North America. And the word importance is, is aligned with ideas of important spiritually, um, important to us culturally, important sometimes in the case of that plant's place in the natural ecosystem that where it resides. And as a result of that, you know, like, like I said, I came down with the 80 plants and then proceeded to, as best I could, tell the stories of each one of those plants so that people who read the book don't just have the name of the plant and what it's used for, they have been introduced to the plant as a living entity. And so that's, uh, that's the importance of, of the book, I think. Well, Enrique, in closing, one of our greatest challenges remains the inability to recognize the sovereignty of land, to be able to ask what does the land want? And I think about wildlife restoration and land management, and it too is devoid of honoring land's role. No doubt in my mind, because to do so would be incompatible with the profit-driven world. So can you speak to the practice of asking what does the land want and how does one begin to listen to this? Well, we first have to begin with honoring and recognizing and speaking of the land as, as an entity, as a being in itself. And as a result of that, recognizing that it has rights. Watersheds have certain rights. Mountain ranges have rights. You know, desert scapes, prairie scapes have certain rights, and ocean scapes have rights. And if we recognize them as, you know, recognize the rights of these particular uh, natural systems, then we can work to first listen to what its needs are. But we got to start first recognizing that this is not a human-centered relationship. And unfortunately, that's where, that's the perspective and the vantage point that most of the world has been working from for, for the longest time. And if we turn that around, then we can start to leave these landscapes alone for a little while so that it would allow us to see what its needs are and then work towards developing those needs. And in a way where we can work in concert as human beings with these natural worlds. And it'd be amazing what we can learn from it, from being able to stop and pay attention and stop looking at the land in terms of dollar signs. You know, we see these dollar signs for the most part when we see landscapes and start to look in terms of what are, I guess, the... Um, the possibilities from working in concert with what the land can give us. What are the things that we can celebrate from such a relationship? And this is, I, I'm, I'm, st I'm, I'm uh, sort of stuttering here because this is a difficult thing because like, we see this every day happening, you know, in different landscapes around the world where it's all about profit and we're increasingly destroying our relationship in these specific landscapes. And somehow leaders around the world need to recognize these living entities. And that's where it needs to, to start. But until that happens, the destruction of natural systems is not going to end. Fortunately, maybe unfortunately in the, in the minds of some people, um, the earth is going to take over at some point and tell the, those of us who are destroying it in, in a very um, harsh ways that it's time to stop. I think, you know, I started thinking this way back in, in January and February when we first started getting word of COVID-19. 
that this is just the opening salvo from the earth telling those of us who have been destroying it, you know, you guys might want to stop. <laughs> it's uh, it's time maybe in a Hopi way for the fifth world to come about. The Hopi believe we are in the fourth world. The previous three worlds were destroyed and we emerge into this fourth world. And maybe the earth is telling us through this virus, you know, this this world might be ending pretty soon. It's time to start over again. Yeah, so anyways, a long-winded way of trying to answer your difficult question. Oh, Enrique, this has been such a meaningful, deep, and beautiful conversation. And it was personally very moving to me. So thank you for your time and for the devotion you've put into your life and the way that you have uh, walked with it. Been my pleasure. I enjoyed it. Thank you for listening to For the Wild podcast. The music you heard today was by Justin Cromer, Katie Gray, and Sarah Serpa. For the Wild is created by Ayana Young, Erica Ekram, Francesca Glassbell, and Melanie Younger.